hey everyone and welcome to blockchain village so in our talk we will be covering about sandwich attacks and we'll cover how we can prevent them with recurrent and recursive zero knowledge proofs so starting with the agenda so this is how it looks like for our talk so giving you a quick speaker's introduction meet mr gokul alex my partner for this talk he's a cryptographer and cryptologist he's a blockchain security architect researcher on ddos attacks he has co-founded many projects organizations so popular of them are giga mesh garages semi out systems and quantum kicksort he's also advisor at red team hack academy and red team cyber security labs if you want to meet him you can visit his twitter account or twitter handle at google keys next is me my name is tj swarastogi so i'm a penetration tester a blockchain security researcher currently a smart contract auditor at colaudits i've also founded a razor sec which is uh, an open source community of security researchers who come together and discuss on various security topics and help everyone to learn and grow i'm also a creator at cypher shastra which is a cdf platform where anyone uh, and everyone can come and practice some smart contract challenges and also some cryptography exploitation challenges as well might be in future i'm also a malware analyst and adversarial ml researcher if you want to connect with me you can visit my twitter handle at razor tweet so starting our uh, presentation let's take a quick refresher over some topics starting with front running attacks so like what is a front running attack so front running attack is something when an adversary having the knowledge of queue transactions uh places its transaction and which gets executed prior to a genuine transaction thus impacting it so like how does this happen so it happens because uh by tricking the transaction selection process so as we know that uh blockchain is a public decentralized ledger meaning all the data flowing in the network is publicly accessible So when a transaction is signed and submitted onto the network it is broadcasted into the entire network so every node gets the information about it and uh, they all get stored into the mempool or memory pool and uh, firstly they are marked as pending because uh, like there are a lot of other transactions flowing into the network so a transaction just entered into the network uh will take some time and will be first stored into the map pool and will be picked up by a miner so miners uh pick up the transaction to add it to a block and they are incentivized for the block creation but here comes an important factor which is the gas price now the miners typically pick and order the transactions in descending order of the gas prices which are associated with the transactions so they do that to extract as much profit as possible from the block creation so here you can see a visual representation of that there are uh, multiple transactions like t1 t2 t3 and t4 uh, all of them have different uh, gas fees associated with them they will all go to a mempool and miner will pick up t4 first because it has the highest gas fees associated with it and following with the t3 t2 and then the lowest one which is the t1 so this means that uh, typically transactions are ordered on the basis of gas price and not as first come first sub uh, basis right so the attacker can take advantage of it and send a transaction with a higher gas fees than the victim transaction so what will be our result for that the result will be 
attacker's transaction will be picked up first impacting the victim. So there are multiple variants or versions of front running attack. Uh, some of them are displacement attack. So as the name says displacement. So it's when an adversary displaces the victim's transaction with its own and with the same values which leaves the victim's transaction with no meaningful or uh, effect or in some cases they are completely orphaned. Example can be like um, consider a smart contract which accepts a secret number and gives the lottery to the user whoever calls it first. Now the transactions after it will either be discarded or won't be uh, making any money. So a genuine user like the scenario. So a genuine user finds a secret, a secret number and submits the transaction. An adversary gets the info of the spending transaction from the mempool. It places this transaction with the same secret number but with a higher gas fee. So as a result, it gets picked up by the miner first and adversary wins the lottery, which leaves the genuine transaction meaningless. So another example can be, uh, which is a popular one, as domain name registration. So imagine like a victim or user trying to register a particular domain. So an adversary sees the spending transaction with the registration request of, uh, of that particular domain, the adversary can front run uh, and buy the domain prior to the victim and can sell it afterwards with a higher uh, price. So this is something called a displacement attack. Moving on to there is an insertion attack. Insertion is where uh, adversary places two transactions uh, before and after the victim transaction thus making a sandwich uh, by inserting the victim transaction in between of his two transaction. Hence, sandwich attack, uh, sandwich attack can be uh, thought of a kind of insertion attack. So we'll come to it later, as this is the main aim of our talk. So next is the suppression attack. Again, this is uh, a popular uh, attack. So here, the sole purpose of this attack is to delay the victim's transaction. Uh, how uh, does they do that? Like uh, by filling the block gas limit. So they so that they can delay the victim's transaction for a certain amount of time. So when uh, this happens, after that the victim's transaction again becomes meaningless or it doesn't matter much because as the adversary have the adversary has already achieved its purpose now. So it's, it can be thought of a kind of a denial of service for the users as adversaries want to maximize their profit per block. So this is also called as a block stuffing. So here uh, our main uh, focus on the insertion attack. So uh, uh, insertion attack or a sandwich attack. So moving on to before jumping into our sandwich attacks, we have to uh, discuss uh, something about automated market makers as well. So what are really these automated market makers in DeFi? Now, unlike traditional finances, where the price of an asset is decided by buyers and sellers, trading that asset. This is called an order book method or order book approach. But in AMMs or automated market makers like Uniswap, they works on a con they work on a constant product algorithm. So for example Uniswap works on X multiplied by Y equals to K curve where X and Y denotes the token results respectively and K denotes the constant product. And the trade happens on a liquidity pool in the AMM uh, instead of uh, instead of uh, like instead of between buyers and sellers in order book approach. So here there's a, a liquidity pool. So anyone can 
sell tokens and buy tokens from the liquidity pool so at uniswap like uh, there's a mathematical formula so if you are trying to swap a token x for token y it will be calculated as a formula uh, on your screen like y multiplied by 0 0.997 multiplied by dx over x plus 0 0.997 multiplied by dx so what is dx here dx is the amount of token x that you are selling so if you are selling token x it will increase the amount of token x as reserve so the output amount of token y can be calculated with this mathematical formula so this is the curve right a bad drawing so it's something like x multiplied by y equal to k so uh, assume this was the initial value of y and x uh, token results so for example if i'm selling some value as dx of token x for example this much so now the output amount or what i'll be getting is something right here right so this will be the dy so this much amount i'll be getting from here from this trade setting so uh, similarly if I'm uh, selling some Y token it will increase the token Y reserve for example here and what I'll be getting is DX here this much amount of dx uh, so as you can see the curve flattens as we go ahead both on the x and y axis meaning less the token the less the token reserve will be the more expensive it will become to buy that asset so for example if supply of token y goes less then it will become very expensive to buy it and we have to sell a lot of token x into the pool to purchase token Y. So this is what something adversaries utilize to make profit. Alright, another important factor is the slippage. So uh, what is slippage? So uh, as we know that the market stays in a continuous state of change. So the prices for assets move up and down. Now the execution price of trade also differs from the expected price so this is called as slippage now slippage happens when traders have to settle for a different price than they initially requested because of a movement in price in the market so this is difference come uh, because the market price was different at the time order enters the market and at the execution of a trade so there's uh, there are two types of slippage first is positive and negative so positive is when uh, the actual executed price is lower than the expected price for a buy order so by by positive slippage the trader gets a better rate for his trade than uh, what it has initially expected right then there is a negative one uh, where the executed price is higher than the expected price. So here the trader gets a bad price for the trade. Now moving on to the slippage tolerance. Now how we can calculate the slippage because there is no sweet point. There is advantage and disadvantage for setting it too high or setting it too low. So how much uh, like uh, it depends on how much slippage tolerance is bearable for a trader or how much movement in price i can live with 
So Uniswap gives this option to us. By default, uh, it is predefined in the uh, in the UI. You can uh, select the slippage uh, which you are considering. So we can adjust that as well. So what it is, uh, it is a percentage value for the slippage that we are uh, that, that we want to set for our trade. So that will be converted into a minimum amount uh, which we are willing to accept for our trade. So if there is a huge price shift in the market and the output amount for our trade is less than the sl uh, set slippage, the transaction will be reverted. So I can keep my tokens but I'll have to pay the gas fees. So the now, the now the question is how much tolerance should be set? Too high or too low? Both of them have the advantage and disadvantages. So if we set the slippage too low, the trade won't be able to adjust with the market price. And although I can keep my tokens, but I will lose the transaction fee or I have to pay the transaction fee. But if I set it too high, then it will open the door for front running attacks, like sandwich attacks, because I, as a user, am willing to accept less tokens for my trade. So what will happen? Attacker will front run my trade for that same asset which I am buying, which I'm trying to buy, and thereby increases my price, um, increases the price of my transaction by making the asset more expensive to buy, and then. Uh, that was we will back run my transaction by selling that asset at a higher rate and extracting profit from the slippage or from the market shift that it had made so there's no sweet spot for the slippage tolerance so that's what the reason it uh, gives birth to sandwich attacks now let's just talk over to our main topic of sandwich attacks. So here you can see a nice uh, visual representation uh, covering what are sandwich attacks. So here you can see that victim sends a transaction as TV uh, from the node. It gets broadcasted to the Ethereum network and gets stored into the mempool. As the blockchain is uh, public and decentralized, the information is distributed to all the nodes and everyone can see that. Now, adversary has already set a spy node into the network. So it sees the transaction uh, from the victim and it observed it and tried to find out whether uh, it is profitable to front run it or not. And by profitable, I mean like it is profitable uh, it, or is it having a high enough slippage? So if it, what it will do, it releases two uh, transaction as TA1 and T2, TA2 uh, by adjusting the gas price according to uh, the victim transaction so as to make it a sandwich and uh, some is to the network. So these transactions are broadcasted again and again stored into the mempool. Now the miner as is typically ordering the transactions according to the higher gas prices. So what it does or how it picks the transaction, it picks the TA1, the attacker's first transaction, then the victim's transaction and then the attacker's second transaction, thus making it a sandwich. And that's how sandwich attack looks like. Moving on to uh, different variants of the sandwich attack. So sandwich attack can be performed by both the liquidity takers and liquidity uh, providers. So these are two popular versions of sandwich attacks. So here you can see the first one is a liquidity taker attacking the taker. taker. So yeah, you can see the attacker sees a pending transaction from TV, uh, a trade of X tokens for Y tokens. So adversary observe this pending transaction 
and try to find out whether it is profitable to make it a sandwich out of it or not. Uh, once uh, it find out that it, yes, it is profitable, and then it releases two transactions with appropriate gas fees in order to be picked up according to the descend, uh, descending gas fees inserting victim transaction so as to make a sandwich. So the first transaction DA1 from adversary will be the transaction trading the same uh, asset as victim uh, transact X for Y which you can see. So because adversary knows the, the victim transaction uh, is trading a large amount of an asset which will be uh, increasing the price of the token eventually. So adversary does the same trade prior to it. Here by increasing the price of the asset which is uh, which the victim trying to buy. And as the victim transaction has a high slippage set, it will result the victim into a worse trade. As now, its transaction is running on a modified price by the adversary. And the adversary state has made token Y more expensive to buy by buying it beforehand, before the victim transaction. So the victim transaction will result into a least amount possible. So, and afterwards, it will back run the victim transaction by selling the Y token at a higher price with transaction A2, TA2. So what he, uh, it's doing is selling the Y tokens for X to get his X tokens back and hereby earning profit in X tokens. So which will more than, uh, which will more, which will be more than what it initially had. Uh, and that all will come from the victim's trade. Moving on, there's another variant uh, called uh, performed by liquidity provider. So sandwich attack can be made by providers as well. So again, the motive is uh, same for front running and back running a victim transaction. Uh, so how it's done here? So again, uh, adversary sees a uh, transaction and observe the profitability out of it. The liquidity provider releases three transactions here. Firstly, the adversary front runs the victim transaction with TA1 by removing the liquidity. So what will happen? It will increase the uh, unexpected slippage for the victim. And then at uh, entry in transaction TA2, it restores back the liquidity by adding the liquidity into the pool by back running the victim transaction and then finally it transacts Y again uh, to get his tokens uh, to get X tokens uh, to make the uh, to make its X tokens equal to what it had prior to the attack so again a very simple trick to make a sandwich out of victim transaction and earn profit so now we know that sandwich attacks, what sandwich attacks are and how are they executed. Now let's just talk about how we can prevent them. So let's just take a quick intro to zero knowledge proofs. We'll try to understand uh, these zero knowledge proofs uh, in a very uh, simple example, with a very simple example. So actually what are zero knowledge proofs? So, so you can uh, take them as like a way to tell someone that uh, you know something without actually sharing any information about that thing. Yeah. So let's take a very popular example to understand it. Considering there are two users, user A and user B. User A wants to sell two balls to user B, but the condition is he wants to reveal the balls to only that person who will actually buy the balls and doesn't want to share any information about them to any other buyer because a buyer can cancel a trade in between but uh, uh, will also get the info about the balls. So on the other hand, the user B wants to buy two balls but the condition is she wants them uh, to be of different color. So here in the scenario, what user A will try, he will try to sell the two balls without sharing any info information about them but still making user B believe that they are uh, they are actually of different color. So he will put a blindfold on her eyes and give the balls to her. 
Now user B wants to verify whether they are actually a different color or not or user A just bluffing or lying about it. So what she does, she put the balls one in each hand, put her hands back, behind her back and now she can decide whether to shuffle them or not. So if the balls are actually of different color then user A will be in a position to find out whether she has shuffled her hands or not. So let's assume uh, this first time user A correctly find out whether she has shuffled the balls or not or shuffle her hands or not but there is a chance that user A just bluffing or just making a wild guess out of it because yes it is possible there are just two balls and the probability of making a wild guess here a wild guess here is just one by two or half of it so but user for the first time user A correctly finds out that uh, whether user B has shuffled the balls or not but user B is not satisfied yet because uh, as I just told she uh, as I just told user A can uh, make a wild guess out of it so what she does she repeats the process one more time now the probability of making a wild guess for user A will be 1 by 4 so user B can repeat this process as many times as she wants until she gets satisfied because we know that after n number of times the probability of guessing or making a wild guess will become so small that it will become almost impossible to make a wild guess for user A. Now user B has verified after a certain uh, number of attem attempts that what user A is saying is right and he can't make wild guesses uh, these many times and hence the balls are actually of different color and now she can buy the balls and trade will be successful. So this way user A has sold the balls without even sharing any information about them. So this is a very simple example of zero knowledge proofs. So zero knowledge proofs are of two types interactive and non-interactive. So the one example you are seeing uh, which I have just given is an interactive one where the proof the prover user A and verifier user B both are interacting with each other. There's also non-interactive proofs where a prover sends the proof and the verifier can verify itself. So moving on to the next slide. There are three important parameters for zero knowledge proofs or mandatory parameters for zero knowledge proofs to satisfy. The first is completeness where uh, it, if a statement is true then the verifier will be convinced that prover possesses the correct input. Second is the soundness so here if a statement is false then no dishonest prover can convince verifier that they have the correct input. Thirdly the zero knowledge parameter. So if a statement is true then no verifier learns anything other than the fact that the statement is true which we have just seen. The user B while making the trade just had an idea that whatever user A is saying is true without getting any other information about those balls. So this is what zero knowledge proofs are. Now I'll ask my partner Mr. Google Alex to uh, share more about uh, zero knowledge proofs, ZK snarks and how we can use recurrent and rec recursive proofs to prevent these sandwich attacks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Tejaswa, for setting the context of the sandwich attack, the front running attacks, and how the problem is becoming a really a big challenge for the decentralized finance protocols on Ethereum and other ledger, ledger systems. Now we are going to deep dive into the system of zero knowledge proofs and understand how we can address or try to address the problem of front running and back running and the sandwich attacks through zero knowledge systems. This paradigm of zero knowledge proofs 
were invented by three brilliant researchers in MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Professor uh, Silvio Micali, Shafi Goldwasser, and Rakoff. And uh, all the three, they came together with a groundbreaking conceptualization about probabilistic proof systems, which was in infancy till 1980s. So when we look at the history of zero knowledge proofs, 1985 is the time when uh, this concept was proposed, but the, it was written in a, uh, it seems it was published in a, in a scientific journal like Scientific American. And by 1992, we could see that the research on zero knowledge proofs have grown, uh, has uh, risen exponentially. And we got something known as succinct zero knowledge proofs or space efficient uh, zero knowledge proofs. And uh, earlier, there were two paradigms of zero knowledge proofs. The initial, initial architectures were about interactive proof systems. But in, uh, the interactive proof systems are not feasible in all the situations. And thus, uh, a non-interactive system, you know, argument system has its own merit when we look at a distributed system setting. That's when that, uh, so initially non-interactive proofs came into emergence. And then by 1992, succinct zero knowledge proofs came into existence. Ever since 1992, we, are, uh, we have seen a lot of research into the various ways in which we can realize non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. And Pinocchio, uh, which was invented or which, which was conceptualized in 2013, has, it's a milestone, it's a, uh, it's a breakthrough, real breakthrough, because this has first time in the history of the probabilistic proof systems made a, a non-interactive proof systems a, a really practically possible. Like Pinocchio was something, Pinocchio was something that we can realize. And in 2016, growth 16 based a, a Pairing the, the, the growth 16 is all about pairing based uh, cryptographic system, elliptical curve based uh, non interactive zero knowledge proof system. And uh, it, it really opened up the way for introducing a, the zero knowledge proofs into blockchain platform. And that has been the dawn of uh, zero knowledge proof cryptography in, in blockchain systems. And then the size of the proofs and the need for trusted setup. These were two constraints in all the zero knowledge proof systems. And that's what, that's the challenge which is addressed by ZK Starks in 2018 by uh, Professor uh, Ben Eli Sasson and his team. Now, when we look at the zero knowledge proof system closely. How is it a radical change from the status quo? It can be seen as a transition from client server architecture to prover verifier architecture. Hence, we can say that this is more, an ob more of an objective ontology for uh, web, web uh, World Wide Web and Internet, because client-server architecture is something uh, at the root of it. It's a service-oriented architecture, looking at web as a collection of services. But web has gone beyond just services. Web is now uh, web connecting systems of meaning, systems of engagement, systems of uh, uh, truth, systems of trust. And hence, we need something more than a client-server system. And that's where the prover verifier paradigm becomes very, very prominent and relevant. 
before we deep dive into zero knowledge proof systems further we should understand that these are not the only uh, privacy preserving paradigm or privacy technology that is being used in blockchain systems since we are talking about block village uh, presenting proof systems in block village our focus would be on what are the uh, ways in which these recursive and recurrent proof systems revolutionize or have the potential to revolutionize the the privacy preserving paradigms along with uh, zk snarks zk snarks is the uh, zero knowledge proof system used in zcash and many other protocols along with it we have protocols other privacy technologies like coin join ring signatures and uh, nimble wimble you can see which all projects have implemented these privacy preserving technology coin join being used first time in dash ring signature another milestone and the revolutionary privacy preserving technology that is used in monero and uh, uh, mimble wimble used in grin and beam when we say privacy preserving technology this uh, there are two major uh, priorities or pri the purpose for using privacy preserving technology either to hide amount or hide the addresses when we look at the zero knowledge proof system now we need to understand zero knowledge proof systems in a little more, bit more closely and now when we uh, try to do that we can see that zero knowledge proof systems work through initial trusted setup that is a, a, if i tell you broad level broadly zero knowledge proof systems can be classified into systems which require trusted setup we call it uh, a ceremony or the zero knowledge proof system which doesn't require trusted setup and uh, there is another classification uh, what is it a contextual snark or universal snark snark stands for succinct non interactive arguments of knowledge as you see in this diagram when you look at the life cycle initially we set the parameters for the ceremony and the trusted setup then we do the key generation there where we have some residue toxic it's called as toxic waste and which has to be removed and uh, after that there will be a common reference string which is uh, which uh, is produced by the witness and then there is an arithmetic circuit the, so there we should understand that there is a transformation of uh, proof from an argument of knowledge into an arithmetic circuit that happens in zk snark system this is very important any arbitrary program any argument of knowledge could be converted to an arithmetic circuit this is the kind of transpilation a transformative compilation that happens which which helps us to digitize the arguments of knowledge that is what makes it uh, uh, very relevant in a uh, blockchain like system or any other digital decentralized distributed ledger while we look at zero knowledge proof as at the data level there is subtle difference between the zero knowledge proofs and the utxos in bitcoin in the utxo it's uh, something about the input that you give and the output that you generate and the output of the previous transaction becomes the input of the next transaction whereas there is an aggregation of inputs the what you see is inputs are uh, transformed to output and then you generate a proof so the proof is an intermediary step then this proof connects adjacent transactions this is the very simplistic explanation of the difference between utxo based ledgers like bitcoin and others and zero knowledge proof systems when you look at the construction of a snark what is very important is uh, this here we are seeing uh, the succinct non interactive arguments of knowledge snark being used for a 
circuit sat sat is a kind of uh, uh, np heart problem which is used in uh, which is used for uh, proving the difficulty of a lot of algorithms so this is a circuit sat problem so you have to convert a circuit into a quadratic arithmetic program this is the codification happening so this kind of a np heart problem can be solved using the the binary sat problems there are different kind of sat problems this binary sat problems uh, uh, can be solved using the construction of a snark uh, and the uh, snark this is this here we deal with a snark where there is a common reference string you can see that the sat is the sat is stats sat stands for satisfiability right so uh, a, a binary circuit is codified into a uh, expression a mathematical expression it, this is known as a quadratic arithmetic program expression and that is the one powerful possibility from zero knowledge proof so any circuit any kind of uh, 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 circuit system arithmetic circuit can be converted into an expression uh, a cryptographic expression a np hard problem this is a more detailed view of such a circuit so on the left side you are seeing uh, a circuit system where we have different points of multiplication and addition in a circuit and we are seeing how we are converting this circuit into uh, a kind of a kind of logical expression so this is where we can say that zero knowledge proof systems convert initially they convert an arbitrary program into arithmetic circuit and from arithmetic circuits it becomes a probabilistic proof a probabilistic logic a logical proof expression what are the components of zk snark see the what you see in the previous uh, slide is uh, eventually when you depict it in a matrix representation it is known as rank 1 constraint system r1 systems that is a specific kind of matrix uh, matrix representation so we have initially an arithmetic uh, arbitrary program is converted to an arithmetic circuit and from there we generate r1 cs rank 1 constraint systems and from this r1 rank 1 constraint systems we can produce quadratic arithmetic programs and we can produce linear proofs so initially there is a uh computation at the hardware level where you could use fpgas or six or any kind of gpus for this computation from the computation you are producing an algebraic circuit which is converted into a rank 1 constraint system which gets transformed to a quadratic arithmetic program which gets uh, converted into a linear probabilistically checkable proof that is called pcp this linearity is very important because uh, we look at these every replicated state machine in blockchain as a linear uh, state machine if it is a non linear state machine like a chaotic uh, cryptographic system then it would be a different paradigm altogether so the use of r1 cs and quadratic arithmetic program is very important and we should get linear probabilistic checkable proofs and linear interactive proofs which eventually becomes the zero knowledge succinct non interactive arguments of knowledge so finally the 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 initial part is done by the prover and the witness and finally we have the verifier the verifier verify whether it's a zero zk snark this is about zk snark systems so what uh, let's now reflect on this life cycle of zk snarks it transforms arguments of knowledge into arithmetic circuits and it's a transpilation of circuits into r1 cs and the quadratic arithmetic programs this diagram on the right side shows it a little bit more in a in a very simple manner when we have an expression we need to prove for example we want to prove that the 2 is a even number or we want to prove that 7 is a prime number we have to convert that into an arithmetic circuit from that we are synthesizing an rank 1 constraint system which 
gets uh, using inverse FFT, inverse Fourier transform, which gets converted to quadratic arithmetic program. And then it is fed to the prover. Prover uh, generate the proof and send it to the verifier. Verifier verifies it. The same quadratic program, when we have a trusted setup, we generate the parameters. The parameters, the, the, there are two keys, verifier key and the prover key. Both prover and verifier work with their respective keys. So the, this is completely an asynchronous computing, uh, asynchronous uh, uh, computation. That's the power of it. It gives great security in an asynchronous setting, which is very, very uh, strong requirement for various distributed systems like digital identity systems, various uh, voting systems, or various kind of uh, financial and non-financial use cases. Now, we have to think about the, what is the, how ZK snarks and generally zero knowledge proofs are relevant to cryptocurrencies. First, we start with uh, expression, an argument of knowledge. Like we want to prove, whether we want to check the legality of a transaction. For example, we want to verify if this escrow contract is legal. First, we have to flatten the escrow logic or the escrow expression into a circuit that gets converted into a rank one constraint system. And then through inverse Fourier transform, it gets converted to a quadratic arithmetic program. And then it, uh, uh, we send it to the prover first. Prover creates a transaction, off-chain transaction. Prover is an infinitely powerful Turing machine. And the verifier is a finite uh, finite Turing machine with limited power because verifiers most of the times in the cryptocurrency settings, verifier would be a smart contract or a particular uh, system running on a replicated state machine in a blockchain. So that was a good introduction. That was just an introduction to the zero knowledge proofs. Now we have to see the larger spectrum the, the, this has been a Cambrian explosion of zero knowledge proof in the, if I use the words of Dr. Professor Eli Ben Sazon, right? So uh, there are different kind of snark compilers, pre-processing snarks where we pre-process the, some of the uh, proofs and then there is a dark compiler, then there is a normal snark compiler. Snark compiler could be linear proof or linear encoding. Then we use different kind of uh, uh, fields and groups for creating commitments. The commitments can be different kind of commitments. It can be polynomial commitments of different type, such as Pedersen commitment, uh, or uh, 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 recently there is a new commitment which is being uh, introduced in Ethereum. And the proofs can be uh, algebraic. So algebraic proofs are used in pre-processing snarks, linear probes are also used. And in systems uh, like stark cryptographic hash functions and random polynomials have a lot of importance. There are three types of groups we can use. Groups of unknown order, generic groups, and bilinear groups. Bilinear groups are commonly used in uh, linear encoding systems. And uh, groups of unknown order are used mainly with... Uh, dark compiler. So we can also classify proof systems into the proof systems which use common reference string and the proof systems which use structured reference string. So common referencing is the simple implementation. And uh, there, right now there are a lot of innovations coming up. Like uh, we, are, we measure the performance of the uh, systems based on the proof size and the verification time. So there are a lot of them, as you see in this diagram, prominent uh, CRS-based systems are Halo, Bulletproof, and Fractal, and Aurora. Recently, new things are coming up like Spartan, Supersonic, which are very fast. The slower ones are like uh, Bulletproof systems, Aurora, Ligero, etc. Aurora Lite has been introduced with a structured reference string. And the elliptical curve that we use, that's also a differentiator. Growth 16 has been one of the most popular one. 
and uh, BTCV and uh, MNT are also some other elliptical curves being used. Okay, now let's uh, proceed to the next slide. Before moving, uh, I, I just moved a little faster. So the next slide, what we need to, uh, in this particular presentation, our focus is on recursive and recurrent proofs. Uh, how they are very useful for addressing sandwich attacks in DeFi systems. This is our proposal. Recursive logic has been implemented or recursive proofs have been implemented in a lot of uh, systems, uh, zero knowledge proof systems. Like Halo, Halo is one of the most popular example for recursive proofs. We will deep dive, we'll see the recursive proof systems in a little bit detail here. And then we have uh, the new, we would like to propose new set, two other set of logics based on incrementally verifiable computation. Uh, which is a white paper, uh, I'm just, uh, which is the, another white paper published by an MIT researcher. So we are using, uh, we would like to propose identity logic in space and time, along with the inductive and iterative logic of recursive proofs. Moving on to the next slide. This diagram, so I just want to show you briefly what is the uh, how the an example of a recursive proof. Recursive proofs, early recursive proof systems were constructed using trusted setups and cycles of expensive pairing friendly curves. This is an example of a recursive proof. And uh, if you look at an example of a recursive proof construction, this shows how do we uh, generate. Uh, uh, one proof which becomes the input to the another proof system and there where how do we do recursion so these two are based on mnt4 curve uh, one is based on mnt4 curve other one is based on mnt6 these are two different kind of elliptical curve systems used in mina protocol which was earlier known as coda protocol here we can see the example of recursion so elements of a recursive proof system are the, the, the mainly incrementally verifiable computation is at the heart of recursive proof systems. So this is at the heart. We can use them to, the use cases are to verify the sequence of order of transactions. The one core concept of recursive proof systems is proof carrying data, which can be extended to obtain verifiable distributed computation. Halo is a very popular example for a recursive uh, proof system, which has been proposed for various voting systems. Voting can be considered as a recursive proof activity because we, we you do the same operations in a hierarchy, in a recursive way. You vote across the, uh, for ex example, you do the same voting across countries. In countries, they do voting is in different states, states, continue that in districts or smaller uh, uh, local governance units. So HALO and HALO2 are two proof systems with a lot of uh, recursive features. Now let's move to the next slide. Yeah, so now we are, uh, we are just uh, un trying to understand the HALO proof system. HALO proof system consists of a polynomial commitment scheme, which we mentioned earlier, and it uses inner product as uh, uh, the arguments are based on the inner product systems. We, we know outer product and inner product in sets, groups, and rings. Here, it's based on inner product arguments, and it is a polynomial commitment scheme. It also uses a cycle of elliptical curve. The, here it's an important point. The cycle of elliptical curve with proofs constructed on one curve that verify the proof constructed over the other. This relationship is very, very important for recursion and which is very, very useful for reflexive proofs and recurrent proofs. This makes the, our, uh, our proposition 
a vive a, a real possibility recurrent proof system recurrent proof system we are highlighting the importance of uh, time the, the uh, dimensions of time and space together because that is the only way we can prevent attacks from uh, the 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 attacks like the the front running attack and the back running attack time transitivity of proof carrying data will be a, a metric and then time is truncated because the proofs have ability to condense compress the data the time transitivity and time truncation capability of pcd proof carrying data is harnessed here and then in the so the the seek the 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 time variable time becomes a dynamic variable here that any uh, changes in the the time the linear record linear metric of time will be considered as a time turbulence so we will uh, we are introducing a time turbulence verification between the uh, the, the different actors in the mempool that is what we are proposing in recurrent proof systems and recurrent proof systems will be composable so we want to use it in a multi party computation setting and then it will be made portable through interoperability between the proof system that's the long term roadmap initial roadmap is to achieve time transitivity in proof carrying data and then time truncation and time turbulence verification this will become clear to you when you see the solution architecture so uh, we want to give little bit details about time truncated proof systems as we have, we have mentioned about probabilistically checkable proofs pcp pcp is a way a vast area in cryptography pcp theorem is something everyone should refer if they are working on zero knowledge proof systems pcp systems enable proofs to be verified in time polylogarithmic in length of a classical proof this is why pcp theorem is at the heart of zero knowledge proof systems the main uh, equivalence is proof of knowledge is equivalent to time space complexity this equivalence is leveraged or harnessed in building time truncated proof systems so you know from earlier introduction by tejaswai you know that computation the soundness completeness and the zero zero knowledge property these are three properties so soundness is very important computational soundness is very important for probabilistically checkable proofs and that helps to shorten the length of the transmitted proof so transmission of proof is very important for a, the the we have to we have to understand the proofs are transmitted between different actors in a probabilistic proof system that is the benefit we are leveraging to create time truncated proof systems moving on to the next slide yeah so let me show the next slide the recurrent proofs are the proof systems where proof prover uses space polynomial in the space of classical prover and time so recurrent proofs will be a kind of uh, a metamorphosis between the space met, met, space variables and time variables that's why the prover a uh, prover becomes the time in which prover act on the 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 proof is used to generate a time sensitive uh, time sensitive space polynomial and it is the assumption is that this polynomial will be a linear polynomial and uh, where when verifier verifies it it will be a constant that's how we are able to achieve it in a uh, i mean we don't get into a np hard situation because the verifier verification happens in a constant time so uh, we would like to leverage the spartan proof system for this uh, the recurrent proof construction
moving on to the next slide let let us show you the solution summary solution summary the the main thing is as you have seen the 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 crux or the fulcrum of the attack on the 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 sandwich attack happens on the mempool so the access control to the mempool will be through proof of order and proof of hierarchical access because we are using recursive recurrent proof we will be able to generate proof of order of transactions and proof of hierarchical access because in the in the near future ethereum uh, is going into uh, use incremental different uh, merkle trees called uh, verkle tree that will be launched in the future in the near future by the ethereum engineering so our prover will be time optimal transaction prover using spartan proof system and we will leverage the recursive proof system of halo to the proof carrying data at the uh, will be used for storing the contract execution order on zk snark and transaction ordering will be done through a uh, a new cryptographic library that we will create called triangular time locks triangular time lock will be a new constraint system uh, which will be built using the zk stark of starkware so this we are trying to we are trying to propose a system a hybrid of zk snark and zk stark where there will be triangular time locks we will uh, we will detail the 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 anatomy of time, triangular time locks in uh, one of in our roadmap while we are working on it currently we are working on triangular time locks we have extensively worked on verifiable uh, random functions and verifiable delay functions so uh, but this time this is a, a triangular time lock will be a time lock which is uh, dynamically created at a particular uh, space time trust uh, uh, instance so this will be very useful for sharded distributed ledgers which are sharded so triangular time locks we are uh, introducing for sharded systems um, for initially we will come up with a contract smart contract based uh, deployment and later we will uh, apply this into our proof system so this is one of the first system with hybrid hierarchy of zk snark for access control and zk stark for the transaction ordering so recursion recursion for recursion we are leveraging zk snark and for time locking we use the zk stark because that's more uh, faster even though the proof size is bigger but when you look at it time is a time stamp or any time property in a distributed ledger this is not big in size so that's why we are confidently using zk stark system and stark pairs zk stark it has been the best performing stark system uh, in the recent times so the, the second one is this will be the first integration between uh, the vdf triangular time locks vdf and zk starks the zk stark already they have an integration in stark pair but we will the this will be one of the first hybrid hierarchy of zk snark and zk stark and uh, this will be um, one of the first system where the the vdf will be integrated with the triangular time lock and uh, let me quickly take you to the diagram the architecture diagram of our proposal so this diagram shows you how the how we are going to leverage recursive proof and redundant proof recurrent proofs one on one uh, side we are doing transaction ordering second side we are doing transaction timing this helps us to create a very uh, versatile prover which can make sure that the transaction that comes is coming from the Uh, the real node not from a spy node or adversarial node and then it can be verified by the a verifier so this is where we the all our changes are happening in the provers not in the verifier side hence we are expecting that this will be an interoperable system for multiple kind of uh, zk snark and zk stark but this is our uh, er, the research early research we have lot more to work on this area 
and uh, uh, we we are really happy to get this opportunity to present this in DevCon. And thank you so much for giving this opportunity to DevCon 29 Block Village. And uh, thank you all for listening to us. You can we will share the presentation with more details uh, with the uh, Block Village team.